someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who sent me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich toward God. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. He said... I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. Eat, drink, and be merry. Another little story. Once upon a time, there were two old men who had lived together for many years. And in all that time, they had never quarreled, never fought, never so much as had a disagreement with one another. So one day, one of them said, do you suppose we should try to have a quarrel sometime just to see what it feels like? Well, perhaps, said the other, but I really don't know how a quarrel happens. And the other said, look, here, we'll do this. I take a brick, and I put it between us, and I say, this is mine. And then you say, no, it's mine. And then that's how the quarrel will begin. And so they placed the brick between them. And one of them said, this is mine. The other said, no, it's mine. And the first said, okay, it's yours. (laughs) And they went away unable to fight with one another and never thought of trying to do so again. Well, I'm going to guess that you, like, like I, don't know very many people who have this problem of not knowing how to argue or fight about possessions. I think we learned it when we were about two. And honestly, part of me, at least, part, wants to have the problem that this rich man has, right? This rich man in Jesus' parable, he has a problem of what to do with too much. It's a story about a man who is so rich, he doesn't know what to do with all that he possesses. And Jesus tells this story. And the story goes that his land, the land of this man, produced abundantly. You know, probably in some Bibles, and the one we talk about this parable, we often call it the parable of the rich fool. Well, God does call (laughs) you a fool, but Jesus doesn't. He simply tells us about a man whose land produced this super-duper bumper crop. And this man was already rich because he had all this land. This isn't a guy who had nothing and all of a sudden was given a lot. This is a guy who's fabulously rich to begin with. 
And then his workers come to him one day and say, hey, look, come look at this, boss. you got to see this. The wheat, it's going crazy, that wheat we planted. It's sprouted in this strange way where it's making mountains of food all over the place. So much wheat that the barns he already had will not store what the land has produced. So this is like a a once-in-a-lifetime miraculous extravaganza. But how much wheat could good land yield that a rich man would not have enough barns to store it in? It's something out of the ordinary here. This should be our clue. When something out of the ordinary happens, who's usually behind it? What should he do with all of this abundance? He concludes that it's his, and he needs to pull down his barns to bulldoze them, to build larger ones. I'm not sure why he didn't just build more. Maybe he didn't have any land that wasn't exploding with wheat. I don't know. He's already rejoicing. He plans to eat, drink, and be merry because of the surplus that he is going to have in those very, very large barns. Well, we know something, as did Jesus' first listeners, about what the Bible says about surplus, especially the kind of surplus that this story is talking about, so much that the mind can't even really wrap itself around it. There's two stories, I think, especially help us to understand what Jesus is saying to us in this, in this parable. Remember way back the story of Joseph when he was made steward over all the lands of Egypt. Remember the part of the story where Joseph saves the day by predicting seven years of a bountiful harvest, lots of surplus, more than they needed followed by seven years of famine. So Joseph foresees this, um, and the surplus, it, it kind of is a little message to us that when there's a lot, we should be thinking about the times when there won't be. Okay, So bounty is a reminder of times of need. So it's better to do something with that surplus so that no one will be lacking. So, so far, This man seems to be doing the right thing, right? He's going to build bigger barns. But another story we recall in the wilderness was the people on their way out of Egypt some years later, after they'd been enslaved for many years. Israel gathered manna in the wilderness. Remember that story? And each day they gathered enough manna to sustain them for the day, except on one day. On the sixth day, they gathered enough manna to sustain them for two days so that they could honor the Sabbath and not do any work. So the Bible tells us, it seems, that the, that when you receive a great blessing, like um, this bountiful harvest in Egypt, or the manna in the wilderness, or this wheat abundantly provided, that when you receive that great blessing, it implies a great responsibility to the future, to see that there will be enough to go around when the harvest is not so good. So preparing for the future by preserving the bounty In this tradition we're hearing about from these Bible stories, means preparing not just for our own future, but for everyone's. So this rich man, he doesn't seem really on the face of it to be doing anything wrong. In fact, we'd say he's doing a lot of things right to have received such a gift in his harvest. And if we received such a gift, we wouldn't want to lose it either. The mistake that this man makes... Jesus is showing us, and this is also a mistake we often make. When we think, he thinks the gift is all his, to do with what he likes, to preserve his own sense of security. But God confronts this illusion 
of security. God says to him, you, you fool. You've been around long enough to know how my work, how my way works, God is saying to him. You know what happened to the manna in the wilderness when the people hoarded it? Do you remember that part of the story? If they collected more than their daily quota, the next morning they got up and it was all crawling with maggots and it was nasty. God says, my way is to always provide enough for you each day and for everyone. And then in the parable that Jesus tells, the rich man is, dies that very night, right? Jesus isn't saying this is a punishment from God. Rather, he dies as people die every day. They do. We know this. As even rich people with a whole bunch of accidental life insurance die every day. As we all one day will die. In Jesus' parable, God's message is clear. The things you have prepared, whose will they be now? Well, there's no answer in the parable. But I imagine, as we've been reading along through Luke here, um, that somehow God's gift, somehow through the power of the Holy Spirit, God's gift will be managed. It won't be hoarded. It won't be wasted. It will be used for the benefit of all. It's really interesting that Luke tells this story in a context where Jesus is approached by someone who's concerned about how a family inheritance is to be divided. It's someone who approaches Jesus who's concerned that he will get his fair share. Does anybody here know this story? Yeah. The problem of someone wanting to make sure that they get what is rightfully theirs is a common one. How many family squabbles, how many broken relationships, how many terrible hurts have been caused by that family argument? And it's all because we forget God's way. And we begin to assume that what is essentially a gift is something that is ours, without reference to anyone else without regard for any human need. But there is another way. It's the only way by which both creation and God are honored. And that is for us to recognize that there is no mine or yours any more than there is just you or me. In this way, we become those who distribute the surplus that comes our way. It's a pretty good image, thinking of it that way. In God's kingdom, both the one that is now, partly here at the same time it isn't, and the kingdom that is to come when God's kingdom will be fully in effect, there are no arguments about whose, what belongs to whom, whose is what. It's all God's. It's all God's. Amen.